I'll, I'll start out. I'll start out with um, an apology um, to our speaker. Um, I, I made a little boo boo and I, I send out a thing all to all the universities for Dr. Brian Barbier, but that's a A, B, D, all but dissertation, I think is, <laughs> is how that's pronounced. So anyway, he's, he's a candidate. And um, so that's my error, not his. Um, okay, so without further ado, tonight's talk is entitled The Experimental Archaeology of Oliver Shelbead Making. And Brian Barbier is a PhD candidate in the University of Anthropology, the UC Santa Barbara, and um, or the Associate uh, Curator of Anthropology at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and coordinator of the Central Coast Information Center, now also at the Museum of Natural History, Santa Barbara. He has spent decades learning and teaching traditional technologies and crafts such as flint napping and basket weaving. He applies his practical knowledge to these skills to his archeological studies by performing uh, replicative e experiments aimed at better understanding traditional technologies. And tonight I will give you Dr. Barbier. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for having me come out to virtually to give you this talk. Um, so I guess I've got to click twice here and let me just switch you guys to the, can you all see the title page, which I borrowed from my last talk and forgot to change the title on? So there's my mistake. Um, yes, we see it, looks fine. All right. So um, yeah, so this is generally an uh, introduction to um, where my research into shell beads started, uh, beginning with experimental archaeology and then moving into just a preliminary sort of look at the research that I've uh, begun doing for my dissertation. Um, and um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, been hired by the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History just two weeks before the pandemic started. So um, I've been a little bit sidetracked with my new position there um, for a while now. And um, and so I'm dusting the old uh, dissertation research back off here and you guys are getting me motivated to dive right back into it. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing it with you tonight. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about um, is broadly applicable to California in general, but a lot of my data comes from the Chumash region. Um, I live in the Chumash region and work in the Chumash region, and I've had many very um, informative and interesting conversations with Chumash people um, when they find out I'm doing this research, um, who've shared with me their own thoughts and insights on how beads were used and what they meant to their ancestors and what they mean to them today. Um, and so I'll just start out by acknowledging um, those people um, colleagues and associates of mine um, from this local region. <clears throat> so before I get into my research, I'm gonna give you guys a quick intro into shell beads and, and olivella beads in general and the various types that were used and then sort of how bead use changed through time. And then I'll begin with my research with uh, my experimental replication of the production of olivella shell beads. Um, I actually, Re replicated the traditional tools that were used and the process as described, as you'll see in a moment. Um, and then I was able to apply that to um, some data from the island Chumash bead making sites from Santa Cruz Island. And, um, and I'm hoping to gather a little bit more data in, in that vein. And then I'm also looking at beads themselves to determine a little bit about how beads were used in exchange throughout the broader region. So thinking the broader California region in which Olivella shell beads were traded, which can be considered basically from maybe San Diego all the way up towards the Sacramento Valley and Bay, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and I do that by looking at morphological traits of the beads and, and stabilized stope sourcing analysis. So um, without further ado, here's the, um, here we go with just the intro to shell beads and beads in general in California. So you've probably seen some of these types of beads in the various museums. I'm sure you're all um, quite familiar with the collections at the museums throughout Southern California. And so you'll see these that um, California groups throughout 
the state used and traded among themselves beads made from bone, stone, and of course, marine shell. And here, for instance, we have um, clam disc beads, which were used very early in time in Southern California, and then were used uh, much later in time um, out of a different clam up in the in Central California, in the San Francisco Bay Area, in the greater Sacramento Valley region. And of course, um, abalone was used extensively, both the epidermis of the shell and, of course, the beautiful sort of iridescent nacre of the shell. Um, and then various types of stone from serpentinite to schist to steatite um, and all types of other um, beads we used to much lesser degree. Um, but by and large, olivella beads were the most ubiquitous uh, type of bead used throughout California and especially Southern California. And particularly among the Chumash, olivella beads um, were the predominant bead type going back for millennia. And so we have uh, what is considered the money bead. You may have heard of um, the bead that when the Spanish arrived that um, the people they met is ex essentially explained that they used these strings of these uh, thick callus beads as money. But at the same time, both at the time that Spanish, the Spanish came and going pretty far back in time, people throughout the region also use beads for a number of other uses for personal adornment, um, both for ceremonial uh, regalia and for special occasions, but also daily personal adornment. Um, and then the, the different way that those beads were used, there are different types of beads that were used and mixed together and the different colors that might have been combined. Um, both um, as necklaces or embroidered onto other uh, clothing and things um, could be used as a sort of a identifier, a signifier of, of your social status or to maybe identify you with a particular group or family. Um, and we see this throughout California today. I have um, friends and um, sort of, I guess, what do you say, step family in far Northern California or California Indian who uh, their regalia um, used at the dances that are still um, happening today um, are very specific and, and often um, copy very specific lines of style and and as say like what their mother or grandmother or other people have done. So there's there's definitely an identity um, heavily involved in how beads are, are used. Um, and then in the broader context, beads are glued to all kinds of things. Here we have a giant bathtub mortar. It's about Two, two to two and a half feet in diameter. Um, this isn't the kind of mortar you would use to grind acorns on a daily basis. So this was clearly um, a mortar you might bring out during a special occasion or a feast. And so to glue shell beads onto it, as you can see um, remnants here, um, is a way to sort of mark or signify the importance and, and to just um, help display that, that sort of wealth and, and, and other, let's say, non-economic um, values that you want to that you want to signify with beads, and so we see this um, in all types of materials, from wood bowls, which we have just a few of from the Chumash region, and then we even have beads glued onto beads. So here we have bone tubes, which are actually uh, worn like beads, so like very large beads strung in a very large loose string, um, and even a stone bead where all of Ella beads have been glued onto that using asphaltum. Um, and in the, in the lower left case, you can see different colors. That's because there's also red abalone beads and I think some mussel beads um, glued onto that particular bone bead. And so beads, beads have been used um, of various types of materials in, in a lot of different ways um, for millennia. But I'm going to focus in on the olivella beads. And then ultimately, I'm going to focus in on a particular time period um, that, I'm focused, that I'm looking at for my research. Um, and so the olivella shell is this little sort of football shaped shell with a side aperture um, that you may have seen on the beaches. Um, hermit crabs love them for homes. And various parts of the olivella shell were used to make beads at various times. And in fact, um, whether you're talking about Southern California or Central California, um, different parts of the shell may have been used to make different beads or to make beads of different shape, different shapes. Um, at, at different times and in the different areas. And so Chester King uh, did this great study sort of seriating through the time periods uh, based on sites uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel region of these different types of beads used um, beginning at the bottom with the early period. And then these horizontal lines are the uh, sort of chronological time periods that we divide um, 
up in, in the broader um, Southern California region. And so going up on up into the historic period, and you can see these big colorful blocks on the left. Uh, you see the biggest one in the middle says Olivella disc and oval. And so throughout the middle period and on into the late period, those round disc shaped Olivella beads really are the predominant bead even compared to all the other beads. And if you look at all the skinny little lines that maybe you can't quite read on your screen um, over on the upper right, you can see that in the late period, a fluorescence of types of beads occurred, or at least that's how it appear, appears to us archaeologically, um, made out of abalone and clam and different types of columellas of gastropods, different parts of abalone scallops, all, all sorts of things. But based on the narrowness of those little lines, those little columns going up through time there, you can see that they never really amounted to a very large percentage of the total quantity of beads that were represented by those in those time periods. And so what we really have looking at the left side of the graph is that Olivella beads starting around uh, phase M2A or middle period 2A uh, become the predominant bead. And then somewhere around the beginning of the late period, they shift to what we often call callus beads or the Olivella cup beads, which are these thicker beads and which are the ones that are considered the money beads. And then finally, because of uh, you know the economic upheaval caused by the Spanish arriving, um, we have in late period three corresponds to the historic period, sort of after after the Spanish are established and the missions are beginning to be established, we have a shift back to wall discs, um, but now very rough in many cases, or not or not necessarily as as well ground as they were earlier. No, nope, wrong way. Sorry. Along with the beads, which are found you know, throughout California and in the Great Basin and, and Arizona, we also find bead making detritus. And we don't find, uh, and other bead making evidence, that we don't find more of that anywhere else than we do on the Northern Channel Islands. There is a small amount of bead making evidence in the Monterey Bay Area, in north of the San Francisco Bay Area, in Napa County, um, Marin County. And there's a little bit of bead making evidence even in the Bakersfield region um, at some of the Ocut sites there. But all of those areas where you see bead making evidence, the quantities pale in comparison to, say, a late period Chumash village on the western end of Santa Cruz Island, um, which is what this picture on the left comes from. That's the bead detritus, so the fragments left over from the Olivella shell from just one five centimeter level from a small um, column sample um, at, a, at a late period site. Um, close to Christie Beach uh, on Santa Cruz Island. We also find out on the islands the drills. Um, and Gene Arnold at UCLA has um, written extensively about the, the micro drill production on the east end of Santa Cruz Island and, and how um, crucial those were to the specialization of the making the money beads later in time. Um, you can see here in the photo too that they had special bead anvils that were used to help hold the bead blanks during drilling and that were maybe also used to help shape the beads. Um, and we have this evidence it, to some small amount going all the way back to the early period. So this is the only substantial amount of early period detritus that I've been able to get my hands on. This comes from Santa Rosa Island. Um, and here in the early period, they were making rectangular shaped beads. And um, these beads on the left were found in the same context as these bead blanks that you see in the lower picture. You can see that they've already been chipped into a relatively rectangular shape but not yet finished because, um, as I'll talk about, it's it's much easier to finish them after you drill the hole. Um, and so the big question that I first asked, starting with my senior thesis at UC Davis as an undergrad, um, was, well, how much time does it take to make a bead? Because there's been a lot talked about these large bead lots found on various sites and talking about the specialization of the Chumash bead makers on the Channel Islands and how much time investment that must re represent, and whether or not to put that much time into it would require some type of underwriting by the broader community. You know, if people are spending all day long making beads, somebody else must be taking care of other tasks on their behalf, uh, like procuring food. And so people have people have talked about this in the literature um, in various ways, and they've inferred a lot about it, but nobody had actually determined how much it how much time it takes to make these various types of beads. 
And so um, I set out to do that um, using all of the traditional materials and techniques as best as I could replicate. Of course, with experimental archaeology, we are sort of making a guess at what people did in the past. We can't read their minds. And so while we can sort of forensically recreate um, the components and try to recreate the process as best as possible, we are different people with different skill sets and different ways of visualizing the process. And so we do the best we can. And so um, after getting the materials together and sort of learning basically how to make some beads um, and then looking at some of the evidence in the literature of, of what different bead making evidence looked like throughout time. And then spending some time becoming proficient both in making the stone drills and in drilling the beads and shaping the beads. Um, I also then looked at the ethnographic literature. We have a great account from Fernando Labrado, uh, who was interviewed extensively by J.P. Harrington, uh, who did um, sort of the broad ethnographic research among the Chumash in the um, early 20th century. And so luckily Fernando describes his process for making a bead. He actually describes two different methods for cracking the shell open to get the little bead blanks out of it. Um, and so that guided my early attempts. Um, and so just like uh, Fernando describes here, I took an olivella shell and stood it upright and tapped it with another uh, sort of hammer stone until I could break it open and then learn some different me methods for breaking it open in such a way so as to more predictively get the fragments that I wanted that were suitable for making a bead because you could of course just break the shells into pulverize them into bits and not get any beads out of them so even this initial step of cracking open the shell to get the fragments from the wall of the shell to make a bead um, does take some practice um, and then you need to drill the hole. This, this again takes a certain amount of practice to become proficient. Um, and then um, what you get when you try making the beads in different ways, when you crack open the shell using different methods or split the shell down into bead blanks using different methods, you end up getting different waste material left over. And so now I had, a, I had um, the ability to take a look at the waste product I was making in my early experiments and then compare it to some samples from some sites uh, from Santa Cruz Island um, that I had acquired from some fellow grad students at UCSB. And so I sorted through the detritus from their projects and came up with the detritus ty typology here based loosely actually on Mike Macko's typology that he created when he was at UCSB some years before me. And I started noticing at different time periods, in other words, say looking at the early period when they make rectangles, or looking at the middle period when they make saucers, or later on in the late period when they make callus beads, I saw that the detritus, you know, when looked at sort of in terms of statistical proportions um, by these different types, actually parsed out diagnostically. And so the two I have outlined in red here, the spire fragments from the top of the shell, or these little vertical splinters that often are, are just very narrow and sort of the length of the wall of the shell are things, for instance, that I only see in the late period and early period detritus samples, and they're virtually absent from middle period samples. And once I saw that, I went back and then um, adjusted my method for cracking open the shell and figured out um, some techniques that actually ended up creating the same detritus patterns so that I could be sure that the data I was collecting was from as similar a technique as, as what was probably happening for those time periods that I was replicating. And then I went on to replicate the major bead types from each of these time periods. Um, and so here's the results uh, in minutes of how long it takes. And it's it starts with um, the in the early period, the rectangles uh, which you can see sort of at the bottom or running down the middle of the photo of the beads that I, I first made um, at UC Davis, that um, these actually took the least amount of time. And then it turns out that switching to making a round bead, but still from the same part of the shell, from the shell wall, takes just a little more time per bead blank and per bead to, to rough it out. It takes the same amount of time to drill it because it's still just a, a wall fragment of the shell. Um, and it takes a little longer to shape the bead into a circle. I found that if I even just zoned out a tiny bit while I was shaping the round beads, I could easily overgrind on one side and end up with a flat spot. And then I'd have to go back around the whole bead and even it out. 
But then you see a big jump here if you look um, at the right column here. The cupped beads or callus beads um, were the bead that the Chumash started making around 900 years ago, um, That we, the callus bead that we call the money bead. And you can see that these take substantially more time both to get the bead blanks out of the shell, to split them out of the shell, takes more than twice as long to drill them on average um, because that part of the shell, that callus is twice as thick as the wall of the shell. And then it takes a little longer to shape also because the, the, um, the callus is thicker and so it takes longer to grind. And so one of the interesting things I found here, which I kind of didn't expect because so much research prior to, to now, people have focused on sort of the specialization of these micro drills and, and the drilling uh, aspect of making beads being sort of the more difficult uh, part of it. And you intuitively might think that the drilling part would be where you really have to develop some technological prowess or figure out some specialized techniques. But it turns out that the other stages that don't require the drills, but just require simple sandstone abraders or a couple heavy chert flakes actually comprise the majority of the bead making time. Um, and so it's it's not so much just about the drilling. It's really about this whole process is itself a substantial process. And then likewise, um, you know, one of the important patterns we see here is that when when the Chumash switched to making cup beads, both the drilling and the entire process takes substantially longer. Um, and then you you could um, guess, of course, that maybe that actually has something to do with the fact that the purpose of beads may be shifting more towards what we might, in terms of Western economics, consider a true currency, where you want something that is very standardizable, that has a certain amount of embedded value, that's also small and lightweight and easily tradable, and that's not easily counterfeitable. And so that's what a lot of people have approached um, interpreting the change to these cupped beads um, and, and my research, I, you know, I'd say somewhat supports that. I, I don't take quite that sort of uh, macroeconomic view of it, but, um, but it, it does turn out um, that these beads take substantially longer per bead. But I gave this a uh, similar version of this talk um, a few years ago, and somebody in the audience asked the question at the end, and they said, well, if they're twice as thick and we're talking about strings of beads, well, what does that mean? If, if um, they're twice as thick, then wouldn't it actually take less time to make a string of beads out of them? And that was, that was a really uh, fantastic insight that I hadn't thought about. Um, and so it turns out that if you were making strings of beads, if you weren't gluing them onto other objects, but if you're actually going to your end use, your purpose was to, to trade them or use them or wear them as strung beads, such as on a necklace or, on, or as the Chumash used them on long strings that were then measured around um, the wrist in a certain way so, so as to assess length in order to determine a certain set value, well, then it does turn out that actually callus beads being twice as thick as, as the prior type, the saucer beads, when you look at it in terms of, say, a 10 centimeter length of string, actually take quite a bit less time to make. So there seems to be sort of this, um, this trick going on where um, some Chumash bead making innovators figured out that, hey, we can actually make X number of lengths of, of strong beads, which are then the, the main currency, right? It's not the individual beads, but it's the strings of beads that are traded. And we can do this much faster by using this other part of the shell that's twice as thick, so that even though the individual bead takes twi um, almost twice as long to make, um, the string of bead does not. And you can see here in these two pictures at the bottom, you get a very different um, sort of character when you string up a set of saucer beads at the top picture versus those cup beads that nest together. And well, there goes my light, sorry. Um, so those, those cup beads really nest together when they're lined up um, front to back. And, and then when they're ground, they can be ground to a much more standardized and even shape. And so you can even see as these are strung, and of course, these are strung by the people who recovered them or curators prior to myself, but, but you can get the idea that it, it, it is really a different um, product here. 
But just in per bead labor trends, um, what we essentially see is that as time goes on, and we're talking many, many generations of people, but as time goes on through these broad periods of time over the millennia, that investment in beads goes up. And the peak labor investment in the actual making of an individual, individual bead actually also coincides with the time period, sort of that early late period uh, from 900 to maybe about 400 years ago, when we also see the highest quantity of beads represented in the archaeological record. And so beads are becoming extremely important. They're probably serving as a currency or proto-currency, as, as a number of people before me have, have surmised from their own research. But even when we look at the, from a labor investment model, um, we still see that, um, that beads have become um, extremely important, both in the investment in making the beads themselves and just the, the vast quantity of beads that are, that are being used and circulated at this time. Um, and, then, and then the Spanish arrive and that whole system is thrown into flux and the bead makers revert back to making wall beads again and making them in a much more quick fashion and, and probably doing this because of the influx of, influx of cheaper goods that are now available being imported by the Spanish. And so that's uh, kind of in general what I found and sort of the basic interpretations that I'm willing to make at this point based on just what you can say with the um, labor data on making beads. But while I was making the beads, I started thinking about the fact that there's probably ways to assess bead making in terms of rates of bead making at the bead making sites by looking at the detritus because if we could determine how much detritus is left behind per number of beads made, we'd have a much more accurate and quantifiable way to compare different bead making sites, especially across time periods. In other words, we wouldn't wanna just compare the amount of detritus at a middle period site and a late period site necessarily because they're two different kinds of beads coming from different parts of the shell. And so intuitively, I just felt it would be important to figure out how much detritus is left behind by each type of bead. And so I started saving my detritus for about the last half or three quarters of, of the um, experimental trials that I did making beads. And it turns out there's a substantial difference in the amount of detritus left behind. And it, it just happens to coincide linearly with, um, along with increase in labor per bead, we see an increase in the amount of detritus created per bead. In other words, there's just about a half a gram of shell detritus left behind when you make an early period rectangle bead, just a little bit more for saucer beads. I largely find that seems to be due to the fact that you can maybe get three rectangle beads out of one shell, but you usually get two, but you almost never get more than two beads when you're making a saucer out of one shell, and occasionally you only get one. And then with cupped beads, because they come from the callus of the shell, you can only ever get one bead from the shell. And so all of the shell wall, all of the spiral top, all of those other parts of the shell are always waste product, and only the callus is used to make the bead. And so you can see a huge increase in detritus. Well, it happens that um, other researchers have, have looked at just the general amount of detritus that they saw in the different strata at these bead making sites. So some of the villages on Santa Rosa Island or the west end of Santa Cruz Island. And they just saw the, 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 visual, the visually apparent increase in bead detritus when you look at the late period strata compared to those earlier middle period strata. And then you could, um, if. Some of you may even be familiar with Jean Arnold's work. Um, she's written a book about um, the rise of Chumash chiefdoms. In one of her earlier articles in 1994, they actually compared detritus quantities, in, in other words, grams per cubic meter from the different strata at their sites. And they found that this sort of um, shift from saucer beads to cup beads, which coincides with the end of the late middle period and the shift into the late period, they they proposed it was about a 700 to 1,000 percent increase in beads. Um, and when I look at the detritus from the sites that I sampled that were stratigraphically uh, excavated and, and which I can control for time period, I see something similar. I see from that earlier middle period um, about a 600 percent increase. Of course, from the late middle period, which actually happens to be 
um, at the sites I have, there actually actually have to be probably periods of abandonment at the site. And so we don't have, we have much more um, just uh, deposition happening at the site naturally than we do culturally. Um, so it's not a great pair of sites to, to take a look at this question, but we definitely see an increase in late period. However, when we convert the detritus quantities between periods to the number of beads that represents per cubic meter, we actually see only about a doubling of the amount of beads made in the late period over that earlier middle period. And, and when I say earlier middle period, I'm actually talking about most of the middle period. The late middle period is a much narrower time frame. It happens to be, um, you know, I'll actually I'll point it out here um, after this first. Uh, we could also look at the amount of hours spent um, making those same number of beads. So we could say that the number of beads being made per cubic meter of detritus left behind doubles. And because those late period beads take longer, we can see there's like a tripling of, of time investment in making the beads. Um, and again, you're probably noticing that I'm skipping something here, that little middle blip on the graph. Um, and so that's the real interesting question actually here is why that late middle period crash? And again, this question has been asked in numerous other ways about the Channel Islands and about the Santa Barbara Channel in general when looking at uh, demographics, when looking at the occurrence of sites, when people even do studies where they index the number of radiocarbon dates from sites and, and sort of adjust that accordingly um, to the number of sites that are studied. And you see that there's just a late middle period drop um, that has been interpreted by others from a more environmental perspective to have to do with uh, things like the medieval climactic anomaly causing environmental stresses. Uh, Phil Walker proposed that there was probably uh, some level of drought happening on the islands, which reduced the amount of um, available water. Um, we see changes in the way people actually move about the landscape and how long they occupy sites. They seem to be more mobile than they even were in the early middle period. And so the question I would love to figure out how to answer or see how beads fit into it better and don't quite have enough data yet is why, why did it go from the quantity of, of bead production and circulation and exchange in that earlier middle period, which would be from about 2,500 years ago to maybe about, oh, let's say 12, 1,300 years ago, then it suddenly just crashed and then we get this late period fluorescence at the same time that we get this technological shift to making the callus beads. Um, you, could, you could see that that happens to line up also with, um, we see that in the late period across the Channel Islands, we see a population rebound and we see people becoming more sedentary along the coastal sites and the villages becoming larger, households appear to become larger. Um, and so, there, it, there are more people now, um, whether they came back to the islands or whether population just simply increased generation on generation, there are more people in late period. And so it's quite possible that per capita investment in bead making actually remains the same across time for those true mesh bead makers on the islands. I, I wish there was a way to really get at that question archeologically, um, demographics of course, is um, one of the oh. hardest things for us to pin down archaeologically to actually put a population count um, based on the proxies that we have archaeologically. But, but given that um, the late period population, um, you, you, could, you could infer that it's quite likely that the population levels were double the middle period levels by the late period. And we're seeing about a 200% increase in beads per cubic meter. Well, it may be that beads have played just as important of a role in the lives of island Chumash bead makers in the middle and maybe early period as, as it did in the heavily studied late period where we have the largest number of samples, where we have the ethnographic accounts or ethnohistoric accounts from the Spanish, excuse me. And so, um, so, this question, of course, requires much further research from a lot of different angles. And uh, several of my colleagues uh, from UC Santa Barbara have looked at this from a food diversification angle, from other sort of like human behavioral ecology angles, um, and using different types of modeling 
And so I think um, I think the overall interpretation of things like population dynamics and how how something like the circulation and the production of beads relates to that remains quite a fertile ground for further research. And hopefully um, we'll be seeing a lot a uh, lot more interpretations of that based on other lines of evidence. So the experimental research based on those um, calculations of bead production time and, and amount of beads uh, made looking at the detritus was sort of my past research. And moving into my dissertation research, I decided to look more at bead exchange and looking at the beads themselves. And so um, one of the things I've always noticed, I've, I've been doing bead analysis since before grad school, um, starting up in Central California. Um, I, I had the privilege of working on a project in Marin County that um, that had a whole lot of beads, and I was hired around the time that lab analysis started. And so I was able to actually study, um, help with the analysis of the olivella shell beads on that project. And then um, I've been working, you know, with any anybody who will give me the opportunity to do the bead analysis analysis for them. I, I grabbed that opportunity while I was in grad school. And I've noticed through all those experiences that there seem to definitely be some morphological traits on bead lots that where you can sort of intuitively see differences in production technique that are still evident, sort of, sort of the production signatures of how those beads were finished, how well they were standardized in terms of their roundness, or how centered the hole is, that that actually seems to have some regional variation or some, some temporal variation. And so I wanted to sort of parse that out a little bit more and take a look and see if we started comparing beads from the same time period across a broader geographic region, do we actually see any differences um, that suggest that maybe they're actually being made by different people? And the reason that question is significant is because those of you who have probably become very familiar with the broader Southern California literature and the Chumash literature know that many of the researchers down here talk a lot about how the Chumash were the bead makers. And, and it's sort of implied that they were the bead makers for California writ large. But actually I come from San Francisco Bay Area and I went to UC Davis and I started learning about all of this through a different set of researchers who actually are looking at bead production and exchange up in Central California all the time, and not even necessarily considering whether or not any or how many of those beads are coming from the Chumash. And so um, I thought a really interesting question would be to look at interregional exchange between Southern California and Central California, because we do have a time period when both regions are using the same type of bead. And here we have some preliminary analysis um, between Alameda 309, some beads that I analyzed at UC Berkeley, and um, SBA 81, which is um, sort of uh, almost down towards El Capitan State Park. And here, even with just the basic analysis of variance based only on the vertical diameter of the beads, you can see these parse out. Now, there could be a slight chronological reason for this. We do know that um, SBA 81 is one of the earliest sites that we see saucer beads at. But ironically, generally, we see smaller beads early on in the early middle period. And so this particular beadlot that I measured seems to be coming out um, sort of contrary, for instance, to um, if I return to that seriation graph that Chester King created. But this isn't really the right statistical analysis in the end, and I would need a lot more than a few sites um, to parse this out. And so that work will have to be ongoing as I continue to collect some more bead data. So one of the other things I'm looking at to help back that up or help create sort of an alternative line of evidence that you could then test that morphological analysis against is stabilized tote sourcing analysis. And so this is based on the fact that the carbonate in the olivella shell um, contains a certain amount of oxygen or carbon isotopes that are in ratios, those, those um, stable isotopic say oxygen 18 isotopes or carbon 13 isotopes are present in certain ratios based on basically the sea surface temperature of the region that the olivella shell grew up in. And the biggest split we see in isotope signatures is at point conception. In other words, there's a very clear 
difference in those in that fractionation of those isotopes north of point conception versus south of point conception and those are the that's sort of the difference that researchers have, researchers have had the best success in parsing out where did the shell come from and this of course is based on the assumption that the bead makers are not going to trade for olivella shells from hundreds of miles up or down the coast when they have them on their own coast and so um basically what we do is take a set of serial samples from the the face of the bead from each growth line and that is partly to control for things like el nino events or other like short-term um events that would affect that annual sea surface temperature because an olivella shell can actually grow quite a bit in an individual year but a typical mature olivella shell may take five or six years to grow and so trying to get um, a spread of measurements across the face of the bead um, to at minimum figure out did it seem to come from north of Point Conception, in other words, San Luis Obispo County north, or did it maybe come from the Santa Barbara Channel or the greater LA Basin uh, coastal region? And so one of my colleagues at UC Davis, Greg Burns, did this for his dissertation. So he's already parsed out a lot of the stabilized tope signatures for beads from various sites from central and interior California. Uh, he did not do any saucers from the Santa Barbara mainland or the channel, though. So there's still room to do a little bit of research down here, because what he found, if you look at this graph, what you're seeing is the red ellipse is the expected range of isotope signatures for central California shell sources. And the blue ellipse is what you would expect from Southern California, especially primarily the Santa Barbara Channel. And so what you see here actually is that most of the beads from these Alameda and Napa County sites, so we're talking the Greater Bay Area and northwards and even Santa Clara County, um, are actually coming from sources of shell up in Central California. In other words, Central California groups are making their own Olivella beads. In this case, we're looking at saucer beads from the time period I'm interested in. And we're seeing that Central California groups are making their own saucer beads, which are morphologically to the naked eye. Um, sorry, that is advancing on its own now for some reason. Um, are morphologically, um, they're not something you or I just looking at a handful of them from either region could tell the difference. They they look identical, and so that's that's the reason then for those micro morphological measurements. And so this is partly why this question actually has some significance is that up in Central California, around 1500, maybe just 1300 years ago, we see this fairly abrupt shift to what are called saddle beads. And saddle beads are never used in the broader Chumash or Southern California region. The Chumash and their neighbors continue to use saucer beads right up until the late period, at which time the Chumash switched to predominantly using callus beads. They still do use saucers to some small degree, but they switched to using these cut beads. And those cut beads are imported to Central California. It does seem clear that the cut beads are being imported to Central California groups from the Chumash region. But the Central California groups then switch to using rectangles. And so we see that there are time periods when Central California groups are clearly stylistically making decisions to change or adopt new bead types that's not occurring in Southern California. Um, and so this is sort of the direction my research is going. And um, that will be what I will talk to you all about the next time I come talk to PCAS, uh, because it'll be a little while before I um, have all of the data collected and analyzed for that. So that said, I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to take questions and I, I can even throw slides back up if you have questions about particular slides. Oh, I have a question. I actually have a couple of questions, but I'll give other people a chance. Have you ever seen a triangular bead? Not in California. <laughs> I think I've I've seen stone triangular beads, but now I'm blanking on. I've seen them in a museum, but I can't think of what region those were common. I want maybe Mesoamerica, maybe jadeite beads. 
Hmm. But were the um, when they're making the circular beads, they must have come across the re the rectangular beads at some point. Um, do you ever see any incorporation of those older ones into there? They just left them there. Um, well, you know, there it's not. You know, you would assume that they definitely would have seen the material of their ancestors, um, yeah, exposed on the ground and things. But but we don't know to what degree that it would have been taboo to handle those things, or or whether they would have regarded those as being as valuable as what was the the current practice. Those are things that'd be hard to get into the minds of people in the past. Of course, I, I couldn't possibly guess but i could just guess based on having looked at the dozens and dozens of, of bead lots in our own museum in santa barbara um there you virtually never see mixing of the different bead types from different time periods the only exception to that is in the late period they do have saucers and cup beads together often um, in the same context but we also see that they're making both types they're making like maybe 80 percent of the beads they're making at the bead production sites are the cup beads but it still seems that particular villages that maybe 10 to 20 or maybe even 30% in some places. Um, and this is based on the bead blanks, the sort of the broken or discarded bead blanks at the production sites. You'll see saucers and cups in the same strata, um, you know, and, and along with the same types of drill bits and things. I guess I'll ask one more question. <laughs> um, there were land snails with shells, but I don't think I've ever seen land snail shell beads. Uh, did they just not like to use them? You, you do see them elsewhere in North America. Um, I've often, I'll, I'll spin that question around a different way. Why did they pick olivellas to make their beads? Mm -hmm. Why not stick with clam, which was, clam beads were made at least seven, 8,000 years ago. Um, Olivella beads have been used for that long as a whole shell where they just lop the spire off and then stick the string through the whole shell. But, and, and actually Olivella um, whole spire lopped shell beads have been used for over 9,000 years in Western North America. But why did they switch to making them out of the wall of the shell, making those little round saucers and things? Like that? Um, and I think it has to do with how durable the olivella shell is. And you can see this even when you look at the older context, when you're digging in the midden of a, let's say three or 4,000 year old site, um, you can see that the mussel shell is extremely degraded. The clam shell is extremely chalky um, and the olivella shell sometimes looks crazy. And so it just seems to be a much more robust, like, like chemically it seems to, to be more resistant to weathering it's also more durable in terms of handling. The olivella shell takes much more effort to abrade those edges to get them in the right shape. Um, you know, a pismo clam bead takes a while because it's so thick. You know, a pismo clam bead is maybe five to ten times thicker than an olivella, so you're you're grinding a lot more material at one moment. But but the clam shell still you, you see much more material come off more rapidly as you work on it, and so. Maybe it stands the reason that if you're going to actually be trading these things hand to hand, uh, you know, for for probably a long time, you know, we always see the, the final disposition of the beads, you know, where they were um, either where they were discarded or where they were intentionally uh, placed as a as a burial offering and things. We don't actually get to really see the full life history of a string of beads and how many years and how many hands they, they pass through. And radiocarbon dating is not accurate enough for us to parse that out either, you know, if, if they were used for 20, 30, 40 years before they were um, put into the archeological record. So I, I think it really has to do with um, preference for durability. Land snail's not durable at all, I guess, is the, the, the last part of that. May I um, ask you a question? And I have to apologize because it's going to be a tangent off of what you were talking about. I have another question that's more specific. But um, so I, I worked as a crew person in, in archaeology in California for a, a number of years. And then I moved to El Paso 
Texas. And I started, you know, finding about out about archaeology in the Southwest. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing Olivella shells. I'm seeing Pismo clam um, bracelets. I'm seeing abalone shell pendants. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I wasn't aware of this. Obviously, I was paying attention to California, and um, so I, I'm I'm really curious to find sources that discuss some of this exchange, if that's what's going on, or. Um, are people coming to the coast from the Southwest and, and you know, doing their own harvesting? Any, um, any way you can enlighten me on that? A little bit. Um, so during the Hohokam period, and so I, I don't really know where El Paso falls into that in terms of cultural boundaries. Uh, almost, honestly, not it's, that familiar. It's east. Uh, I know it's east, but I'm not that familiar like with the cultural boundaries as they lay across that, especially with the amount of movement that happened in that area later in time. Um, you know, for instance, with the arrival of the Apache and the Navajo into that region, you know, maybe only what was that, I don't know, 800 years ago or something. But so if we go back to the Hohokam period, which would be equivalent to our middle period, you actually do see a pretty robust exchange of Olivella shells into the Hohokam region. And then trade items from the Hohokam westward into California. Um, and Mike Merrill's dissertation is actually on that a bit. He looks at beads arriving in the Salton Sea region that come from the Hohokam because they're a species of Olivella shell that comes from the Gulf. And so, but that's what you also have in El Paso is you probably have very similar ornaments and beads made out of Gulf species. And so depending on the bead type and how much of the morphology of the shell is left over, um, you know, it may not always be easy to determine just by looking at it, whether it was a Gulf species or a Gulf of California species or a Pacific Coast species. Um, and often, I, I wish I could tell you more, but I, I struggle as I find sources in the literature that talk about the occurrence of Olivella beads back east, even in the Cahokia region, they just mention them. And so unless you can go out there and look at them yourself, um, they just say Olivella bead. And so then it's like, well, what type? You know, we we get way more nitty gritty about our Olivella beads out here in California. We use them as chronological markers. We have them broken down. I just talked about very broad types, by the way. You could get into all kinds of subtypes with saucers and with cup beads and everything that I didn't want to, to break it down into because I would have never finished my experiments if I had to like replicate every single subtype. Um, so I just stuck to the very predominant like main types. But yeah, I, I, I have a whole folder of like mentions in the literature and articles of Olivella beads occurring in Kansas, in Montana, in Idaho, Snake River Valley, um, Eastern Utah, Northeastern Utah. And then often, and occasionally I'll meet an archaeologist who says, oh yeah, I saw those beads out there in Eastern Utah and they're, they're, they're standard California saucers. You know, and, and but the literature doesn't always give you those specifics. So I think that's that's something that somebody had. There's probably like five dissertations available to folks to continue working on that, or or maybe somebody's career. Um, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, the other question I had uh, about when the um, the Olivella shells are. Uh, um, beads getting ready to be smoothed out. So were you implying that that they would actually drill the hole and then mount, you know, a number of beads on on what a, a piece of wood and then use an abrasive service surface to to abrade them all as a group? Is, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, they would actually string them at least later in time. We know that um, this is for sure the way it was done with the cut beads. And that's that's fairly evident. I, I can tell this just from my experience making beads that they had to be shaped while strung because any individual bead lot, which we can presume were mostly made together, you know, and they were then strung together, they are so uniform. They they um they often are all within like 0.1 millimeter in diameter of each other. And when you string them up and nest them together, they they look like they were finished together. And so they were likely stringing some small length. So I'm imagining they strung like an inch and a half, two inches worth. And we do know from ethnographic descriptions that they strung them on juncus. 
and then they would abrade them on abrading stones. And so they'd actually probably roll that strung um, group of beads. And what I picture is that if the anvil, the abrasive anvil is like a piece of tabular sandstone, that they're rolling the beads maybe sort of um, at a bias. So, cause if you just roll them sideways, they're just gonna roll like tires and there's not a lot of abrasion going on. But if you roll them and also slide the whole string of beads sort of diagonally on the bias so that you're grinding them lengthwise at the same time you're rolling them over, you could get this. However, for the cut beads, I only made about a dozen. Um, I think I went back before I um, published an article on this. I think I went back and made like six or eight more just to round out my, my counts. But um, but I've never had like 30 in the production stage to, to try that yet. That's, you know, and you saw the numbers. It's going to take me like several hours just to uh, get 30 beads ready to shape. So I'll probably do that at some point um, or probably I'll, I'll just try to swindle somebody else into doing that instead at some point. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that's the way that they did it. However, they didn't do that for the rectangles. We can tell from any given rectangle lot that they have a lot of difference in both the angle the edge is finished at and then the sort of the parallel of the sides is different. They're not always that parallel within a, a single bead lot. And then they're variable both in length and width. So there's there's a big change in sort of the practice of bead making in terms of that shaping over time. Well, thank you very much. This has been fascinating. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I think I saw Thomas had his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, really fascinating presentation. I know very little about beads. Uh, I was going to comment there on that last uh, uh, what's a chart that you had that was looking at stylization of beads between different regions. Um, there was a difference that you would, you know, basically pointed out between Central and Southern California. And I wonder, uh, I, you know, I don't know very much. Is there differences between different regions in, like, you know, uh, the San Luis Obispo area and the Channel and uh, the uh, the Vandenberg region is it all pretty uniform between you know sites there in terms of bead type? In terms of visual assessment, in terms of how we type the beads in these broad groups, so like when we type them into a type G saucer, yeah, they're actually quite consistent throughout the West. So that mm -hmm. when we find beads in the Mojave Desert, they conform to these types. Now, however, Benny Hoffman Hughes in 1989 wrote sort of the, um, the quintessential guide to Olivella bead typologies and chronology. And they do note that there's several unique Great Basin types where it appears that the Great Basin groups took beads they must have gotten traded, you know, down the line from the coast, because of course these originated the coast. And they modified them into types that only ever occur east of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Huh. Um, those are extremely rare though. When those, those ones that are found, they may be found at one or two or several sites, but they're found in extremely small quantities and only at those small handful of sites. When you see the beads that are more broadly exchanged in big numbers in hundreds and thousands throughout Western California, so coastal, Central Valley, um, the transverse range, and on up through the whole coast range and the Sacramento Delta, you could, you could visually look at a saucer bead or a cup bead from say Chico, which is as far north as you'll ever find one of those, yeah. and compare it to a bead from Los Angeles. And just with your naked eye, you're not gonna be able to tell them apart, which is actually why when we type these beads, we type them as a bead lot. Also because there's so much variation like within a bead, these types are these types as we call them, as we group them into are really based on sort of the lot. Mm -hmm. In other words, the whole count of 100 or 500 or 50 or 1000 or however you find them. Because uh, when you find them as a group, you presume they sort of came together as a group and are chronologically related. Um, and so when you look at them as units like that, they're they're very standardized for their time period. And I'm understanding correctly that you know these were produced throughout the Chumash region or you know other regions relatively similar to each other despite the geographic differences as opposed to just being produced in a single place and being exported to different places well so <laughs> i think that question is that question some people have answered that question i think that was a little premature um 
For instance, there's very few bead production sites known about archaeologically in Central California. So in the greater Bay area, there's a handful of sites in Monterey Bay. There's a handful of sites on the San Mateo coast, uh, like at Ana Nuevo State Park. There's a couple sites. Um, and then there, and for all of Ella beads, there's a handful of places we know that the Coast Miwok uh, and the Pomo, um, you know, we know that they, had, we know, for instance, the Pomo went to the coast in Coast Miwok territory, they had permission to go and gather the Saxodomus clams. And then we have the clam bead making sites in Pomo territory and also uh, in Patwin territory and some of the um, upper Sacramento Valley sites, we have yeah. actual clam bead making in the valley. So they're importing the shell material and making the beads there. But for all of Ella beads, we have a real paucity of bead making sites in Central California. And so a lot of people just assumed, I guess that means the Chumash were making them all. But mm -hmm. I think it was really with the stable isotope sourcing analysis that demonstrated that, um, that actually the beads were being made up there. And what they're seeing is that the, the Olivella actually has like an estuarian uh, isotope signature. And that's kind of puzzling because Olivella like to live on sandy beaches, you know, in, in salt water. But the, the interpretation is that the, they must be living in some kind of brackish water to have the stable isotope signature that they have up there in some cases. Um, but other people have thrown out that um, sort of like geomorphologically, uh, places where people lived in the Bay Area and the Sacramento Valley have much greater rates of deposition than along the South Coast here and on the islands. And so those middle period bead making sites are going to be buried 30 feet down. We just, you know, and we see those midden sites along the edge of the Bay. Um, and we don't see a lot of bead making at the big midden sites in the San Francisco Bay. However, those San Mateo sites I mentioned at Ana Nuevo, I did look at some late period late period bead detritus there. And it's very clear they're making a large amount of those late period rectangle beads. I'll throw it back up real quick. The, um, the, the Central California region switched to rectangles, what we now call um, thin rectangles in the late period. Um, and so both Central and Southern California used rectangles in the early period. Both regions abandoned the rectangle form and they began making them again in the late period in Central California. And we call them thin rectangles because on average, when you measure a beadlot from the early and late period, they really are thinner in the late period. Um, and that, that might have something to do with the shell sourcing or something to do with the shell. Um, but what I didn't find at all in like a whole Rubbermaid bin of, of bead making detritus from Ana Nuevo is a single bead blank. In other words, there wasn't one single drilled bead that got broken during production. So they weren't doing any bead drilling or finishing at that site. They were simply splitting the shells and taking away the bead blanks. And so if they were finishing those beads, and so we're talking like a Loney territory, let's say. So if the Loney are going out to the coast to gather the bead material and then hauling the bead blanks into those big village sites uh, on the other side of San Mateo County, uh, you know, on the peninsula, say near Palo Alto, um, you're not going to see a lot of bead making evidence because the detritus is the bead making evidence. That's the obvious thing. You might see the, the stone drills, but absent the detritus, you might not know those drills are being used to make shell beads. And so I think there's just a visibility issue actually um, across the state because of different practices. I think the people in the Bay Area. I think the, between the Ohlone and the Coast Miwok and some of the Delta groups, I think they were making just as many Olivella beads as the Chumash at various time periods. But then again, we also know they definitely were importing the callus beads um, because the stable isotopes definitely uh, indicate that they're coming from the Chumash for that. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Joe, see you had a question in the chat. Can you unmute yourself and ask? Um, yeah, so I thought, given how small these beads are, did they ever, uh, the owners or makers ever decorate them, paint them, incise them? Um, see, none of my photos have it. The cup beads, because they're um, twice as thick, they actually are cross-hatched on the edge in some cases but the face of the beads is rarely decorated. And I think that's because in many cases, the 
face of the bead is not visible when it's strung. It's the edge of the bead that's visible. And then when they're applique on the other objects, like those early pictures I showed of the applique on the other bone tubes, um, it's sort of the pattern of the bead itself becomes the um, becomes the decoration. I always thought it curious that they would glue beads onto things because when you glue beads onto things, like if you look at these bone tubes again, um, you don't need the hole in them because you're not stringing them. However, may maybe the person who glued them on them got them from a string of beads. So maybe the person who glued these beads onto these bone tubes wasn't the original bead maker of the Olivella beads. And, and it's the value of the bead that makes them attractive to add to these objects. Because we have these glued onto all kinds of objects, like every, every other type of decorative object you could think of from um, the larger like deer tibia whistles, um, like here are the st stone beads of various sorts, um, different mortars, the rims of the steatite or soapstone vessels that were made on Catalina Island then have the beads glued onto the rim by the Chumash. So, so yeah, there is, um, there seems to be just a decorative value in the bead itself in that, in that sort of view of all those beads glued side by side. <coughs> right, well, anybody else have any questions or are we all done or? Okay, if so, I wanna- I have a question. Go ahead. Um, can you tell what these beads were being strung on? And if they use different um, material to string them in different locations, that might be a giveaway to where the beads came from? A little bit. Um, this would mostly be in cases where they recovered in dry cave contexts, because those are the only contexts where the organic material usually preserves. And so I had an image of the stringing patterns from Lovelock Cave, Nevada um, on this early slide um, there. So um, I, I'm totally racking my brain here. It's been years since I read that article, but I wanna say that we know that milkweed and dogbane were used broadly throughout California. And we know ethnographically um, that it's documented that the Chumash used juncus. So they actually twined so they would split down the Juncus textilis, which was used in their basketry. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the like the coastal Chumash, um, the primary material that their basketry is made out of is Juncus textilis. And that can be split into finer fibers or lengths um, to make the kind of cordage you would string a bead on. Um, and later in time, they must have been using something like that very fine because we do have bead lots that the um, hole diameter gets smaller and smaller. Um, the beads get very small. We have beads that will go through a window screen, but they've been drilled and then they've been they've been rolled and rounded off very uniformly, but they're only like a millimeter, millimeter and a half in diameter. And so the holes are less than a millimeter. Um, and, and so I'll be honest, I'm not really sure what they used for a string in that. It would have been a very fine, fine cordage, so. Um, Ryan, um, I, I just want to say, this is Marie Davis, how fascinating this is and the, the level of detail. I know you're just telling us the tip of the iceberg of the detail with which you've analyzed these beads. I, I hope you get to finish your thesis. Uh, I can't wait to hear more about what you discover. This is so fascinating. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well. Brian, I want to thank you for tonight. I'm going to be sending you a um, appreciation certificate for your tonight's presentation. It was it was fascinating, and um, um, I want to announce again for next month. It's going to be at the Duck Club. You can get directions from the website pcas.org. We're going to have Dr. Timothy Rowe from the University of Texas at Austin. He's a geologist and a paleontologist talking about um, the Hartley site in New Mexico. And the title of it is called A Surprise Encounter with a 37-Year-Old Mammoth on my, on my, uh, in my Backyard. Uh, he actually bought the land and discovered this, these bones 
on his land. So it should be interesting, and I hope everybody can join us. It'll be an in-person and Zoom combination meeting. And um, unless there's something else, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight and especially thank our speaker. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Drive home safely, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Keep well. Well, if I just say a quick thank you, Stephen, for uh, hosting the meeting and and uh, making the Zoom work all right. So yes, don't think we You're had very too welcome. This worked well. Yeah, other than my uh, my tongue my tongue was a little tied tonight. I felt like I was tripping over my own words occasionally. So hopefully you can edit that all out in the video. Oh. Well, Brian, this is the other Stephen sitting next to Stephen. I'm glad that I got to meet you when I came out to the museum about a year or so ago and I think that your work was so fascinating that I brought it up go. to uh, Joe and said, go contact this guy, get him, get him here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'd kind of forgotten how this connection got made. So thanks for jogging my memory. I, mm -hmm. I think uh, the pandemic has played havoc on my short-term memory. <laughs> um, but uh, all right. Well, I all look forward us. to seeing you guys at some future meetings. I'll try to make some of these if you keep doing them on Zoom. Um, oh, it's a bit of a drive sure. for me, but. Yes, absolutely. Guests are always welcome. Awesome. All right. Well, you guys take care. Okay. Take care. You too. Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Yeah, I was up there a year and a half ago now doing some research and